I want to talk to you today about the nine biggest mistakes that I see people making when they are trying to use CSS Grid. Mistake number one, thinking that Grid replaces Flexbox or replaces Floats. I get it. We're sort of in this mentality of, I want to use this tool, but is it better than that tool? If I want to use this one, that means I'm going to get rid of the other one. I'm going to use broccoli instead of grunt, or I'm going to use JavaScript instead of, these are bad, terrible examples, but usually we're deciding like, I'm going to use WordPress and I'm not going to use Blogger. I'm going to use Drupal and I'm not going to use whatever. Grid and Flexbox are both parts of CSS itself. There's no reason to choose between them. They're both really awesome. They do slightly different things and you want to know what both of them do and you want to use both of them. We're also going to continue to use floats. There are a lot of situations where a nice little float is the perfect solution, especially if you you want to use CSS shapes or have some content flow around other content. That's what a float is for. There's no reason not to use floats. Um, I have a video that shows uh, which one is better, grid or flexbox, not better, but like how, what's the difference between the two of them and how do you use them together? Really the basic uh, basis of it all is to nest one thing inside of another, inside of another. So you'll have a grid and then you'll have a flexbox inside of it. And then you might have another grid inside of that, or you have a flow content with a little grid and maybe inside of there, you've got some multi-column. We've got lots of options. We're going to be using all of them. Mistake number two, people are still thinking that you need to size everything in percents. We definitely want our layouts to adapt to whatever size screen that our users are using, like a responsive website. And in the world of responsive layouts, you size everything by putting a percent width on each and everything in your layout. And that way, when there's less space, everything gets smaller. And when there's more space, everything gets bigger. But in this world, a world I'm calling intrinsic web design, it's not about having everything be percents and squishing and getting bigger in this, at the same time, in the same kind of way. We have lots of different options. We have lots of different ways in which to size things. We have lots of different ways in which to make certain things be fixed and other things be flexible. We have stages of flexibility. Um, I have actually a three part series that you can watch on that. But I think the mistake that I'm seeing as people just assuming everything has to be in percents, their gaps have to be in percents, their columns have to be in percents. Um, and I just want to challenge you to realize that it doesn't have to be percent. There might be times when it's a good idea to use it, especially if you're trying to match some sort of fallback layout, or you're trying to slip grid into a legacy layout that is already in percents. You may not have a chance to redo everything. So percents might make sense. But I think five years from now, when we've sort of switched to the whole new world, we're not going to actually be setting our columns in percents very much at all. There are many better ways to do it than percents. Mistake number three, people assume that you need breakpoints for everything. Again, it totally makes sense. We have this idea that we've been using for eight years that you set everything in percents and then you change the number of columns at a certain breakpoint. If you want four columns, great. Then at a breakpoint, you make it two columns. And then at another breakpoint, you make it one column. And at another breakpoint, you make it eight columns or 12 columns. Uh, but that's not actually the model that we need to use anymore. And there are many ways to use min max syntax and a repeat auto fit or repeat auto fill syntax and save yourself the effort of writing all of those media queries. I also have videos on those things, uh, getting into the details of how to do that, saving yourself a lot of effort. You don't need to use breakpoints all the time. You should learn how to create layouts that react to the size of the content and move things around as needed uh, without necessarily using a breakpoint. Mistake number four, we have habits from the past where we have numbers in our world and we think of those numbers as being the numbers of the columns where you've got column one, column two, column three, column four. But in the world of grid, the numbers in the grid system don't refer to columns. They refer to the lines. So you've got a line number one, line number two, line number three, line number four, line number five. And so a four column layout actually has five numbers, five lines, and that can be a little tricky. That can throw you off. Um, there's a way in which 
You're going to want to purge from your mind the old ideas from some of the old frameworks that we've been using for layout for, oh gosh, 10 or 12, 14 years now, where the, col the numbers are the columns. It's not that now. The numbers are the lines. And once you sort of remember that that change has happened, then it can actually make it much easier for you as you're writing numbers in your grid code to say, I want this to go from line one to line five, and you know that that's spanning four columns. Mistake number five to me is continuing to assume that everything should be 12 columns. Or sometimes I see people say, well, we've got a one column grid for mobile, a four column grid for tablets, or, or an eight column grid for tablets, and a 12 column grid for desktops, and that's our grid. And it doesn't have to be that way. There are good reasons it has been that way historically. It made it much easier to do the math. The math was super hard to do when we had to divide everything using percents and floats and do, manually doing it all ourselves. Uh, but now that we're using the computer to do all this complicated math for us, we can actually very quickly make 11 columns or 13 columns or seven columns or six columns. And we can constantly be changing it around and breaking it up. The columns also don't all have to be the same width as each other. They don't have to be the same size as each other. So there are a lot more possibilities creatively. Um, and I feel like that's a mistake we're still making in the industry is somehow assuming that 12 is better or assuming that 12 is correct when really that's a legacy from a very specific set of technical constraints that we maybe still want to do but we also don't have to. Mistake number six, forgetting about rows. CSS grid lets us define columns, which is the kind of thing that we've been doing for a long time, but it also lets us define rows. And if you don't define rows, all your rows are gonna be auto height, which means typically they're just going to be the height of the content that is in is in that is within them and that can be great sometimes maybe even most of the time you simply want the row to be the height of the content that's in that row if you have photos with headlines then the row will be the height of the photo plus the headline and if it grows maybe the photo is a different size or shape maybe the headline is longer or shorter then the automatically sized height of the row will grow or shrink to nicely fit the content that is in that row. But that's not the only thing that we can do. We actually can use other sorts of measurements and define the rows explicitly and make the rows bigger if there's extra space perhaps in the viewport or smaller. We can, we don't want to make the rows smaller than the content that holds them. We don't want to, typically we don't want to have overflow. We want to always have the row be at least the size of the content, but maybe there's, there are many times when we, when it makes sense to go ahead and like use up extra available space and create some nice, beautiful white space to find rows that are empty perhaps and create better graphic design, especially better graphic design as it reacts to the bottom edge, the fold, and lets us make things size vertically in space that is more complex and more beautiful than we could ever do before without CSS Grid. So don't forget about rows and don't forget to start to think about how you might want to explore sizing in a vertical direction uh, in order to create more beautiful graphic design. Mistake number seven, I see people searching high and low for a new framework to replace their old framework where the new framework just happens to be built in CSS Grid. Or I see people who make frameworks who are wanting to be helpful and wanting to get projects out in the world, open source projects that everybody gets excited about, and they're building those frameworks using CSS Grid. I get it that it makes sense that we think we need a framework because for the last especially the last five years, it feels like every time we ever go to code a layout, the first thing we do is choose a framework. So it, it feels like it's impossible to do it on our own and we have to have a framework. So if you're not going to use this famous framework that's based on Flexbox or this famous framework that's based on floats, oh, let's use Grid. Let's get a new framework based on CSS Grid. Oh, ah, no, please, no, no, no. Uh, we don't need every website to look the same anymore. 
it's actually very easy to write your own vanilla CSS and create a custom framework, a custom style guide, a custom style system, whatever you want to call it, but your own code that's specific for your content, specific for your brand, specific for your users, specific for your interface, specific for your user experience design so that you've got the best layouts for what you're doing and it's not necessarily layouts that have been created for other people. You don't need a framework. Your developers, you yourself can write this code. You just need to spend a little bit of time learning grid and mastering grid and getting to know what grid wants to do. Please let's not create new frameworks. Please. If you're a person who created a framework in the, in the past, I, I, beg you not to make a new framework. We don't need a new version of our favorite frameworks. Now with grid, we need to just let go of prefabricating layouts. And perhaps we have starter kits to help us build style guides and such. There are reasons to share code and share libraries of code, but I think having completely prefabricated layouts kind of in a multiple choice system is just not something that we need anymore. And we can have much better design if we let that go. Mistake number eight, assuming that you cannot use CSS grid until internet Explorer dies. Uh, Internet Explorer is not going to die anytime soon. Internet Explorer 11 is being used in enterprise situations, especially intranets or places where the computers are locked down and people need access to proprietary software for that particular company. Uh, it's going to be around for a long time. So if you're waiting for Internet Explorer to die before you learn CSS grid, you're going to be waiting five or 10 years. Um, there are plenty of ways to write progressively enhanced CSS that works in every browser at the same time, including browsers that are not IE, but who also don't have grid. You want to support those users too. I have a bunch of videos about how to do that. I've got one video specifically about IE and how to use CSS grid in IE. And then I have a seven part series on how to write CSS that works in every browser, including very old browsers that don't have the new thing you want to use. So please, if you're holding back, if you're saying I'm not going to learn CSS grid because IE still exists and it's too early to use CSS grid. Honestly, I feel like you're putting your own career at a little bit of risk. You're, you're sort of saying that you're not going to learn this thing that everybody around you is starting to learn. So don't make that mistake. Maybe you can't quite use it yet at work. I understand you got to be very practical in the projects that you're working on right now, but it is time to really start thinking about it. Grid is now supported in well over 80% of the browsers that are in use. In some countries, it's 85% in some markets or some websites, some audiences, you could easily have 90 or 95% of your users with CSS grid. I know grid has not been out very long, but the way that it came out, the way that it was finished before it was released, the way that four majors browsers all shipped it within the same month and six browsers shipped it within the same year. Um, it's unprecedented. Grid is out there. It's probably much more popular than you realize and you don't want to fall behind. Mistake number nine, being so practical that we don't really give ourselves permission to play or to experiment. I've found one of the best ways to learn Grid and to really start to get to know what it does is to not work on something for work that needs to be shipped next week, but to find some kind of inspiration out in the world, an old poster or a graphic design book from art school or something that you just happen to see. Sometimes a painting on the wall in a hotel is all the inspiration that you might need. And take those ideas and just play to see whether or not it's possible to do those ideas in grid and um, dare to experiment and to explore new territory and see what it is that grid can do. I feel like that is really going to be what gets our industry, our designers, our ideas. It's going to get the web itself into a whole new world where things just really look different than they do now. So we really have to give ourselves permission to play around and to see how, what this thing is and what it is that it could be. So those are my current nine biggest mistakes with CSS grid. I hope that helps you check out the other videos that I've pointed to. And, uh, I'd love to see what you come up with and the experiments that you make, put them in the comments, tweet at me on Twitter. I'll check them out. I frequently retweet examples that other people have made. I think it's the best way for us to play around and see what it is that this new GC medium can do for us.